I'm joined by Derek Williams from DW Science Desk and Martin Gack from our Religion and Ethics Department. Welcome to both of you. Let me start with you, Derek. Now, first of all, how sure can we be of this claim made by the scientist that he's genetically edited babies? Because there's been no independent scientific verification so far, has there? No, there hasn't been. Uh, this hasn't followed the normal path. Generally, you would have had a publication with peer review first of all before, but this, this researcher has made basically a, a claim Online. And uh, as of now, we don't have any real hard evidence to back it up, although he does have the background and he does have the experience to have carried it out. Martin, turning to you now, this scientist insists that what he's done with these babies is to protect them from a condition, in this case, HIV. So he actually says he's protecting them. What's wrong about that? Well, at first blush, obviously nothing. I mean, one would think this is quite commendable, but the fact is that this is a technology that is sort of at its very incipient stage. And furthermore, the problem is that uh, there is absolutely no way to measure what the impact of any one sort of gene editing operation will be. I mean, bear in mind that you would be releasing these people into the population, provided that they grow up and these two, these twins actually reproduce and have children of their own, they will actually be perpetuating this genetic form, I mean, bringing it into a genetic pool. Evidently, we don't know if this has actually taken place or not, but to judge by the reaction of the international scientific community, uh, I think we can assume that everybody understands that this is a possibility, a serious possibility that this is a scientist that is capable of doing it. And I think he's correct in saying that if it's not him, it's imminent that this is going to happen. So a lot of the question here, as far as I'm concerned, is about, once again, regulation. How are we going to regulate this kind of technology? So you have sort of serious ethical concerns about this, but what about you, Derek, as a scientist? Well, I agree completely. Uh, the technology is there. It's been there, actually, for the last eight years, uh, and it's been clear that we could use this technology to do this. We haven't up until now. We've been doing mostly mm -hmm. things with plants, with animals, but the possibility has always been open. People have been, that's why it's been a taboo. It, things only become taboo when they become possible. And this has definitely been a possibility. And so the question is now, I think, that what we need to be, be moving towards, both the scientific community and the world as a whole, is global regulation of this kind of technology, where we really, it's not no more at a national level, where things are possibly allowed, as is the case in China, within certain uh, guidelines, they're, or they're at least not completely forbidden, whereas in other places, they might be. I, mean, I think okay. it's worthwhile, sorry, pointing out that nobody should think that this is something that be, can be pulled back. I mean, if, as a matter of fact, this technology is there and it's being used, there is no way that this will stop being used because we actually think it shouldn't. I mean, this is precisely why we need international regulations because the technology is already there and is usable. See, the thing about regulation is often the boundaries between scientific discovery and ethical concerns are sometimes blurred. So how does one regulate this kind of development? I think that this is, uh, this is becoming, it's not sometimes, blurred more and more often that the technology and ethics are, are 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 coming into conflict with one another we need and we obviously from from my point of view we need to to answer most of the ethical concerns or many of the ethical concerns before we begin to employ the technology in certain ways unfortunately it generally tends to happen in mm -hmm. the other direction yeah. Yeah, yeah very clearly i mean i think that what we actually find in the scientific discourse and the scientific tradition and the way that we implement it in technology because bear in mind that most people out there in the world will actually see science through technical developments i mean some somebody will want to get pregnant not be able and then they will find a scientific development in in vitro fertilization or something like that these kind of things tend to happen in precisely that order it's like we engage in certain practices and then we think, okay, is this the best way or do we actually need to put different forms of, you know, different controls? At this stage, I think that that element here is that it has a certain macabre aspect. I mean, there is something Frankensteinian about this story. Somebody had, that has somehow concocted a human being. Uh, I think that that's disingenuous. I mean, it just helps to actually blur the problem, which is that as a matter of fact, we have a very powerful technology. We don't have a very clear understanding of where it could lead, what it could mean, but it's something that for us could be actually an incredibly powerful tool. So we have a responsibility, sorry, we have a responsibility to make good use of it, so to say. Now, Derek, now you yourself are a specialist in biology and you know that this area of genetic science is very, very competitive with scientists looking at ways to outdo each other. How do you see this? Where do you see this development going? Because as a scientist said in our report, if not me, somebody else would have done it. I think that that's uh, probably true. I also think that you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, if you'll, mm. if you'll yeah. excuse me, in this particular instance. Um, CRISPR-Cas9 technology is, is, is 
a, a, an incredibly powerful tool for doing a wide, wide range of things, including doing things like providing plants with drought resistance. We're able to go in and tinker with evolution and things that might have taken many, many generations to happen in the past, we can now make happen very, very quickly and very, very easily. But just because we can make them happen, doesn't mean that we should, particularly when it involves the human race and possibly the future of humanity. Right, so the implications are huge, both on the ethical front as well as on the scientific front. Derek Williams from our science desk and Martin Gark, our religious and ethics affairs correspondent, thank you very much for your perspectives. You're welcome.